Welcome to our plenary session on the business of building a better world. I'm Audrey Sellian from Artha Impact, and I'm delighted to be here today with this incredible group of colleagues and friends to talk about what is possibly the most critical turning point of our times, the inflection of where business as the most widely available mechanism and form of agency to nearly every person on this planet becomes a force for good. So I'll admit that I'm a bit of a SOCAP groupie here, attending the conference every year since it began in 2008, having been associated with Halloran from its early days when they were among the very first supporters of the SOCAP conference. This makes our conversation today that much more meaningful to me because I can attest to the power and passion of our huge SOCAP community and the many interactions in and around the festival pavilion at Fort Mason over many years, both intentional and coincidental that have led to such powerful collaborations. Yet uh, many multicolored and some purple elephants can fit into that pavilion for those of us who know the place. And one of those elephants has been whispering to us, what happens as impact becomes mainstream? Well, what is more mainstream than business? And what is more mainstream than the desire to do good by our families and our communities? As these lines cross and overtake the pure primitive profit motive, Numerous considerations arise that our contributing authors and speakers will reflect upon today as we explore together what's next for this ecosystem. Together with David Cooper Ryder at its helm, we've spent the last two years conceptualizing and putting together a book entitled, rather auspiciously, The Business of Building a Better World. It's published by Barrett Kohler and tied to a concurrent form underway through October 28th called The Great Leadership Reset. And our book comes out in a few weeks, and in it we have the reflections of globally renowned thought leaders, CEOs, and practitioners, three of whom are sitting virtually with David and I today, Raj Sisodia, Jillian Marcel, and John Elkington. My co-editor, David Cooper Ryder, is a distinguished university professor at Case Western Reserve University and is the faculty director of the Fowler Center for Business as an agent of world benefit at the Weatherhead School of Management. He's also a full professor in the Department of Organizational Behavior. And David is also the honorary chairman of Champlain College's Cooper Ryder Center for Appreciative Inquiry and has authored 25 books and over 100 articles and book chapters, serving as an advisor to many companies and organizations like Apple, the US Navy, and the UN Global Compact. John Elkington has three degrees and is an entrepreneur, advisor, writer, and one of the founders of the Global Sustainability Movement. He is founder and chief pollinator at Volans, having co-founded four social businesses since 1978, including sustainability in 1987, all of which still exist. He has served on over 80 boards and advisory boards and written 20 books, the most recent of which is Green Swans, The Coming Boom in Regenerative Capitalism. John is a visiting professor at Cranfield University School of Management, Imperial College, and UCL. Jillian Marcel leads Resilience Capital Ventures, LLC, a boutique capital advisory practice specializing in blended finance. She has worked in investment on telecoms, fintech, renewable energy, and regenerative agriculture. And she has developed the Triple B framework to improve flows and allocation of capital in its multiple forms. This provides a platform for engaging in the finance and investment world where her contributions and perspectives on diversity, inclusion, accountability, and alignment with the SDGs are becoming influential. Her experience includes roles with International Finance Corporation, Equity Capital Markets at JP Morgan Chase, and M&A with British Telecom, as well as Associate Professorship at the Wits Business School in Johannesburg. She holds an MBA from George Washington University and a PhD from the University of Sussex. Raj Sisodia is Distinguished University Professor of Conscious Enterprise and chairman of the Conscious Enterprise Center at Tecnologico de Monterrey, and co-founder and co-chairman of Conscious Capitalism, Inc. Raj is co-author of the New York Times bestseller, Conscious Capitalism, Liberating the Heroic Spirit of Business, and Wall Street Journal bestseller, Everybody Matters, as well as The Healing Organization, Awakening the Conscience of Business to Help Save the World. Raj has published 15 books and over 100 academic articles, and he was named one of the 10 Outstanding Trailblazers of 2010 by Good Business International, among other accolades. He has consulted with and taught executive programs for a wide range of companies, including AT&T, Nokia, Kraft, Whole Foods, Tata, Siemens, the list goes on. 
He has a doctorate in business from Columbia University. So with this incredible group of people, I'd like to dive right in without further ado. Uh, first question for David. For years, you have been pioneering research about the intrinsic advantages that collaboration, cooperation, and connection bring to leaders and their organizations. Your methods are designed to support humanity as it moves toward unlocking the expanse of its potential. Yet, we're at a critical juncture and global divisions, great societal reckonings, and a climate crisis loom large. What makes you hopeful today? Thank you, Audrey. It's a great question. And, um, and I do want to say that my sense of hope about what we're capable of has gone up and up and up. And um, my specialization in the applied sense is very large group planning, bringing a thousand people into the room, all the stakeholders in a system to um, come together for three or four days, not with panels and expert talks and so on, but interactive planning. And I'll tell you when my sense of hope began to really grow. Um, and, and then I want to talk a little bit about the speed at which things are moving. But for me, um, it was an amazing call. It was a surprising call um, from Kofi Annan's office um, a number of years ago. Um, and he said, we want to use appreciative inquiry to create the largest meeting in history between CEOs and the United Nations. And this was an exciting moment. The UN Global Compact was very early and just getting started. And, you know, less than 50 companies at that time. And, um, and we, you know, it was, it, 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 it was beyond my capabilities, but it was, you know, a, a really important moment. And I have to say, um, besides the appreciative inquiry part of it, coming together to design and discover um, and create a growth plan and so on. But besides that, I felt such inspiration and hope, um, especially from the senior leaders. And um, at that time, you know, 50, 60 companies part of it. Three years later, there were over 2,000 companies part of the effort. The next session took place in Geneva, Switzerland. And I have to say, I started feeling things that I had never felt before as a management school professor. You know, I'm sitting in the room with people, you know, at a table with people like Jeffrey Sachs and others. And Jeffrey was pounding the table. He said, we got to get it right now. We can be the first generation in all of human history to completely eradicate extreme grinding poverty, the kind of poverty most of us can scarcely imagine. Um, Jane Nelson then speaks up and shares her stories of this, the technological advances we're going to see. Um, she shared the research at Vienna University where they spray on solar cells onto windows and every building can become a power source. And, and then Ratan Tata, you know, talking about their commitment to human rights and human development. And he's pounding the table and saying it's time for all of us as CEOs to stand up, to step up and to scale up. And at that moment, I started to realize what a special time we're living in, you know, um, and, and it continues, you know, it's not utopian for us to talk about the complete eradication of the grinding poverty by the, by the end of the next couple of generations. It's not utopian to talk about a once in a civilization transition to a bright green and um, completely clean energy world. It's not um, utopian to talk about every child being access to school all over the world um, and every single child. So we're living at this special time and this led us to our research for the book on the business of building a better world. And um, it's coming out at the end of October here. Um, but what was clear to us as we set it up, um, the book, um, I, I like this um, comment by the late Rudy Dornbush, a macroeconomist. Um, it's called Dornbush Famous Law. And he says, things take longer to happen than you think they will. And then they happen faster than you thought they could. And I think that's um, what I want to punctuate. And we punctuate in the first part of the book. Um, we build a lot on Mariana Mazzacuto's three volumes. She's one of the top economists in, in the world today. 
And she studied, um, she, she's an amazing economist, her three volume research has studied when economies are the most dynamic and they're the most dynamic when they have a mission at a national level and so on. And she calls it mission economies, not just high purpose companies, but mission economies. And she studied about 120 different mission economies and the dynamism that happens. And the model she uses is in the archetype of all of them that she refers to was the moonshot, a moment of Kennedy. And the, the, what it does to the unifying of efforts and the building of pride, but more than that, the dynamism of technological innovations that you wouldn't expect, like the internet was born and so on. So anyway, um, you know, I think some are calling this moment now, not so much a moonshot, but an earthshot moment to underscore um, not just the probable dangers, but the giant opportunities to lead. And, um, and I, I, my sense is, is, that, um, is that, you know, our aim as a whole SOCAP community needs to, we, we should make this moment um, an earthshot moment. It, we're not there yet, um, but that's the task is to, is to build that kind of earthshot moment. And for me and the book, the North Star is a little bit beyond sustainability. Let's call it sustainability plus, we call it full spectrum flourishing. Um, that is a, a full spectrum flourishing is defined as a world where economies can excel, all people can thrive and nature can flourish, not just now, but across the generations. And that's what gives me hope right now. I think we might be in the largest globally collective moonshot moment, we're about to enter it, um, that we've ever seen. And there's been others, you know, the global eradication of smallpox, but that pales in significance to the earth shot that we're facing. Um, the Marshall Plan, that pales in significance to what we're facing, um, and, and on and on. So anyway, that's what gives me hope right now. And I think this is a moment uh, um, for all of us to seize. Thank you so much, David. Um, next question is for Raj. Um, there's so much more awareness today of the shortcomings of the capitalist model, not least because of the work you've done on highlighting how conscious, embodied, connected practices result in outperformance. How far are we today down this road? Where does the trigger lie for the psychic shift for the mainstream awareness that will help us reconfigure the core nuts and bolts of our global economy. Well, thank you, Audrey, and thank you uh, to SOCAP for uh, hosting this uh, this important gathering. And I'm always tremendously inspired by the poetic and brilliant uh, wisdom of uh, of David. Uh, uh, you know, the the capitalist model has, of course, done a lot for humanity, as we all acknowledge, in the last two hundred years where 90% of people were living in extreme abject poverty, and today that's down below 10%. There's still a long ways to go before everybody's truly flourishing, but I think we have to acknowledge and, in fact, celebrate what capitalism can do and has done. But at the same time, we have to elevate it, because if we don't elevate it, we will decimate it. I truly believe that these populist movements and certain countries going in the other direction are, are signals or indicators that something is not quite right in the capitalist project. And I think we all know what that is. The so-called externalities are overwhelming us. Uh, the lack of uh, inclusion and the fact that income inequality has grown so dramatically. And of course, all of the consequences that we see, the existential threats that we, we face. So that makes it imperative that we move in a different direction. And I think the uh, uh, the uh, gratifying thing is that uh, there has been a significant shift, and I think 2019 was a bit of a watershed uh, in that regard, where more and more people are now talking about these kinds of ideas, whether they use conscious capitalism or other terms. For doing that, specifically with conscious capitalism, just for those who don't know, we say there are four things that you, you need to think about. The why, what, who, and how of business have, needs to have a different answer. So it's higher purpose, not just profit. It's a stakeholder integration, not just shareholder value. Uh, it's conscious leadership, which is about not just achieving the, the results, but actually creating a vision and taking people to a better place and creating cultures, caring cultures 
uh, where people actually look forward to going to work rather than they're getting burned out and stressed out as, as the vast majority of people are. So I think where we are heading now, and we seem to be in the middle of this trans transition, is uh, we spent the last decade or so talking about what is this shift that needs to happen and why does it need to happen? And I think today more and more, uh, the question is about how. How do we do this? It's not really, not that many people, some still are, but not that many people are questioning the need for substantial change. So it's really now about how do we help companies evolve in this way. In terms of the trigger for the psychic shift, which is an interesting way to frame it, uh, for mainstream awareness, I think you know it goes back to rethinking what is business really? You know, we don't question that enough. The idea of free market capitalism where you know governments don't take care of people in free market uh, democracies, it's, it's really uh, companies, businesses are given that opportunity. And so in instead of thinking of business just as a way to make money, if we think about it as this is a mechanism for us to meet each other's needs. We all have many, many needs and there are different ways that we can meet them. And we have discovered that businesses and capitalism is a tremendously efficient and effective way to do that. But as with everything, how you approach that task makes all the difference. You know, how do you see what business's role truly is? And I, I think the best way to think about it is that business is that, that we are all here as human beings to grow and to uh, take care of each other. You know, as Richard Leider said, a generic purpose for a human being is to give and to grow, right? And the fact is that we have created a world, especially in the capitalist uh, economies of the world, the more materialistic uh, value systems that prevail, where instead of give and grow, we have kind of defined our purpose as grab and go. And that has to change. Mm -hmm. This is not about how much can I take and how much can I accumulate before I, in a sense, exit the system. So we have to th think about this as if my role in this life is to give and to grow, how can I evolve myself? And then how can I give? How can I impact other people? And in my ordinary life, I can do that for a handful of people. But if I start a company, I can actually have a positive impact and care for hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of people. So I think that is fundamentally a shift in, way, in the way of thinking. And if you do that, I believe businesses become places and sources and forces for healing rather than the source of a lot of stress for a lot of people. You know, we know all the statistics, right? 85% of people are disengaged and heart attacks are higher on Mondays. And of course, all of the other devastation that has happened because of this profit-centered mindset. It doesn't have to be that way. So we can, businesses can become a source of healing and regeneration uh, rather than for, for too many people, a source of suffering and erosion. So I think that is the fundamental shift that needs to happen uh, in the sort of psychic awareness in the in the mainstream about business. Gosh, thank you for that reflection. Um, a next question uh, for John. Uh, a lot of what is being discussed and debated in our social innovation sector is that big change is coming. For some, this is a truism. For the visionaries of the next shift beyond more primitive capitalism, it means something quite specific. Uh, what, in, in your eyes, are the harbingers of this change? Is it, you know, is it, is it the, is it the green swan? But, you know, we need to have the eyes to see its color, I think. Uh, when do we know that this change that's coming is real? Thank you, Audrey. And, and, and unlike you, you're a self-declared SOCAP groupie. I'm not, but I'm thrilled to be here. And I cannot wait to see the book that you and David uh, have, have uh, done. Um, I think these sorts of changes come through once in a lifetime. There's a sort of slight rhythm to them every 60 mm -hmm. to 80 years, and they are driven by many different things. The exhaustion of economic models uh, by new technologies, by new entrants in terms of global uh, you know, geopolitics and, and, and so on. Um, David uh, mentioned Mariana Mazzucato. There's a growing number, Kate Rayworth, others of economists who are beginning to look at almost the Friedman era, the last sort of 50 to 60 years, that sort of economic paradigm and see its flaws. I, I talked to somebody just um, three days ago in Cambridge uh, who is a senior partner in one of the big four accounting accountancy firms. And he was saying this particular firm is in the process of recruiting 100,000 new people to work on ESG, environment, social, 
and governance. And even he said, what we're doing is scaling a flawed model. Uh, I, I, I don't think that ESG is automatically bad and far from it. Uh, and I think it helps people think about impact and all sorts of other things. But if we are indeed in one of those moments where an old macroeconomic order, an old geopolitical order is sort of disassembling around us, then I think we have to step up, as David said, in a very, very uh, and much more sort of imaginative uh, way. Um, a couple of other things very quickly. Uh, some people might know that I coined the term triple bottom line back in the mid-1990s. I did a product recall uh, of that through the Harvard Business Review in 2018. Uh, part of the reason I did that was, again, not because I thought uh, triple bottom line thinking as practiced by B corporations around the world was a bad thing. Absolutely not. But I felt that it was not uh, being uh, used in a sufficiently systemic uh, way. And so what we've got to now is a sense that most of that work has been done in a responsibility framework. How can business, which we're largely talking about here, mm -hmm. uh, be more transparent, be more accountable, engage its stakeholders more effectively, uh, you know, sort of rattle its supply chains and all that good stuff. But what we're seeing, and, 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 and Raj and David have already referred out to it, is uh, very clear evidence that all of our systems, pretty much all of our systems, our economies, our societies, our politics, our biosphere, they're all wobbling in a very, very concerning way. And all of these wobbles are interlinked. So people are now, you listen to political leaders, you listen to CEOs, you listen to investors, and they're talking about resilience. How do we build everything? More resilient supply chains, more resilient economies, and all the rest of it. Well, lovely. But you can't simply go down on your knees and pray for more resilience. You've got to regenerate the systems that you're dependent upon. And I think whatever term we use, we're now seeing that that sort of notion of reinvention, reimagining, restoration, regeneration uh, coming up, and with even many capitalists uh, now talking about that need. So I think this is a magical moment. It's an incredibly dangerous moment. Uh, I think the next 10 to 15 years are going to be the most challenging and exciting of my entire uh, working life. I'll stop there, but I, I love what people have said today, and I look forward to the, the rest of the conversation. Thank you so much, John, uh, as well, for your important reflections. Uh, I, have a, I have a question for Jillian before we, we move on to a, a singular question for the whole group. Jillian, you have done such important work in different parts of the world and have a background in technology policy and finance. And as we move from theory to practice, as we navigate from our white papers to the ground reality, what are the forces that are influencing how investment happens to your mind? What are the key elements, like on a camera, aperture, shutter speed, and light, what are the key elements that help us capture the sharpest picture of what's underway today? Thank you, Audrey, for that question. And it really is a good analogy for me to answer because I think that there have been many things said uh, by my esteemed colleagues which um, provide some seeds to the answer to that question. However, the way that I would come at this is to invoke Robert Chambers, whose book I'm sure all of my colleagues are familiar with, the famous book, Whose Reality Counts? Because while I agree with my colleagues about the, the ways in which they have described capitalism, I also, as a person where my intellectual foundation is in the Caribbean, would invoke Eric Williams, Capitalism and Slavery. Because, of course, capitalism, while it has done many of the things that have been said, was always imbued with racism, imperialism, and the ravaging of the majority of the world. And so as we approach the 21st century, the concerns of the global majority are very important for how business is shaped. Building a better world by business must include those 6.9 billion people for whom 
the wealth of the 1% is actually twice as much. So when we speak about the we, we really need to be careful that we are including all of humanity and reminding us and the SOCAP audience that there have been cosmologies and our cosmologies that have done a much better job at stewarding the planet, being in community. And much of that is actually not even taken into account. And so one of the things that I think we must do at this moment is to call for cognitive justice, to reclaim wellsprings that have not been given the rightful place as we as a human family think about what things we do. And my esteemed colleagues have made important strides in shifting the mindsets, the mental models of the major companies in the world, those that really do have a lot of power. But are those the only wellsprings where we should be drawing our strength, our purpose, our guidance? In the project that David and Audrey have set up, what myself and my colleague Jed Emerson have done, and in particular in the companion piece that accompanies the book, is I shed some light to go back to your analogy of the camera. I shed light and illuminate blind spots by pointing to examples of good practice where we are already having a flourishing human experience that are not in the Western press, that are not in the mainstream business books, but that have much more to tell us about planetary stewardship, about community, about dignity. And so as we're name checking, I would say that for my money, the esteemed scholar, Carlotta Perez, whose work on technological paradigms probably tells us what we need to know. Because this is also a period where the forces are in contention. And those fruits that are coming up and showing the way are also dampened down, excluded and silenced. And so I think that this project provides a very good opportunity to remove those barriers, to illuminate blind spots, and to really allow the shoots for human flourishing to come from all across the planet. So that's, that's what I am doing, and I'm really delighted to be in conversation with all of you and with the SOCAP audience. Thank you, Jillian, for this uh, incredibly important point that you've that you've made, and and um, as a reflection, as we reflect on the rewards of putting all people at the center, on fixing what's broken, but also on appreciating what's not, and on navigating what SOCAP was first created to address the intersection of money and meaning. I'd like to ask now each of you to um, add your thoughts on, you know, if, if the role of business is indeed a seminal one, tell us in your words, how? What can small, medium, and large businesses do to own this narrative and be rewarded for doing so? What should each and every one of us further be telling our friends and families when we go home tonight? I'd like to ask Raj the, this question first and ask each of you to reflect upon it in turn. Well, you know, uh, capitalism is a system, and I, I acknowledge all of the uh, caveats uh, that Jillian pointed out, but it is a system that promises and delivers this incredible dynamism, innovation, uh, creative destruction even. And the fact is that we're going to have to reinvent just about every aspect of how we meet our needs on this planet in the next century. And that, I believe, cannot happen without the kind of innovation that capitalism actually gives us uh, and the dynamism that uh, that it has. But as Jonathan Haidt has said, we need to integrate 
dynamism and decency, right? Socialism promises decency, but has not really been able to deliver that because it doesn't generate enough incremental value. It simply divides it. But we need, we all crave as human beings, we crave decency. And I think a capitalism that does not deliver decency will die just as socialism failed to deliver uh, a dynamism and therefore did not did not survive so i think it's important to recognize that profit which which so many people hold as a central tenet you know profit itself is is actually a social good i believe you know free market societies don't function without corporate profits because governments don't generate wealth governments can tax and spend for the public benefit the wealth created by businesses but but as we know it matters how we make the money and that's where you know we, we have to recognize that businesses can create but also destroy many kinds of wealth. It's not just financial, intellectual, social, emotional, spiritual, ecological, physical well-being. All of these are impacted by how we operate in business. So I think we have to, if you think about how can uh, businesses own this narrative and be rewarded for doing so, one of the important things to remember and point out is if you do this purely from a self-interested materialistic perspective. In other words, if the research shows that these kinds of companies perform better <clears throat> and are more profitable, and that's why you want to do it, well, then I think it could actually do more harm than good. We have to do the right things for the right reasons. We have to focus on the right actions, and then the right outcomes will follow. So I think that is very important. This has to be something that emanates from within, that leaders truly believe that, that uh, taking care of people, taking care of the planet is the right thing to do, and not just because that is likely to lead to superior performance. But it can, they can make it an inclusive process. You know, all the wisdom doesn't have to reside in the leaders. You can tap into the wisdom and humanity of, of all the people uh, in every organization and people have incredible wisdom uh, to offer. And then the last thing I would say on that is that leaders have to work on themselves. You know, your organization is only as conscious as the leader and if you don't continue to evolve in that way, uh, then, then we get stuck. And in terms of what people could tell their friends and family when they go home tonight, I mean, I have a simple way of expressing that, which is that everybody matters and everybody needs to win. We have a system that has too many losers and a few winners, but we have to craft a system in which actually everybody is simultaneously winning uh, in the broadest sense of that term. Raj, thank you. That's beautifully put. Um, Jillian, may I ask you to also reflect on the same question and then John and then David. Jillian, you're on mute. I think businesses, small, medium, and large, are places where we actually realize some of the best parts of what it means to be human. That's why I'm running a, a, a small private sector uh, capital advisory practice. Businesses and work are places where we create and shape. We also exist in businesses as a group activity. It's very rare that we are solo. Large multinational companies are called upon to solve really, really complex problems. Without large multinational companies, we wouldn't have you know, the means to communicate around the world. We wouldn't have uh, transportation systems and so on. But what I think is important is, and what, why this project is so, is so necessary, is that we can question what we do with the surpluses that are generated and even the meaning that we attach to those surpluses. And so I think that this is a good time to be engaging with the purpose, the fundamental purpose of business in terms of generating surpluses and using those surpluses to care for societies, for care for individuals, to solve problems and take up new challenges that we uh, are going to be confronted with. And I, I think I must introduce the issue of the COVID-19 pandemic because that to my mind has been a failure of the mainstream ways in which we are organizing business and international cooperation where we celebrate a model that has not been able to produce vaccines and distribute them around the world. That should be a wake up call. And so what do I tell my family? I was talking with my mother this morning and what I tell her 
even if she do doesn't understand much of the detail, is that the work that I do is to help widen the solution space, to make sure that when we think about global challenges, we are actually bringing in the wisdom and the talent of people like her into the arena and on the agenda. So thank you for the question and thank you for the engagement. Brilliant, Jillian, thank you. Uh, John. Well, listening to all of this, it's a very rich uh, conversation. I've worked with business now for over 40 years and a couple of things I've noticed are these, and very briefly. The first one is that um, when markets know broadly what they're doing, uh, there is a great deal of advantage in being a very big company. So you can scale and, 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 and get the good things out there. When, when markets are being disrupted, suddenly it's people on the edge of the system. It's, you know, 20 years ago, Elon Musk, when, when Detroit couldn't even see him. Um, so in a, in, in a way, SMEs are where some of the most radical innovation is, is happening, but it's masked by the fact that we think of SMEs as not terribly important. I mean, in aggregate employment and pollution, the rest of it, of course, they are. But I, I, I think we've really got to refocus away uh, or at least expand the focus from the very big companies to uh, people on the edges of the system. The second thing is that every so often there is a moment where young people wake up. It happened in the 60s, it happened in the 90s, it's happening again now. And the, if I had 10 pounds or $10 for every time a CEO or a senior business leader has said to me in the last sort of year to 18 months, it's the conversations I'm having at my breakfast table with my family that are really now driving my sense of urgency. I wouldn't be a rich person, but I'd, I'd be a good deal better off than I currently am. And they also say, and the good talent that we're trying to recruit in now, the questions they're asking us now are really uh, quite taxing and, again, driving the thought uh, process. So those conversations, we all have them every day. We often underrate their importance. We've got to have more of them, and we've got to make sure that they're even more effective uh, over time. So let's pay more attention to the smaller players, and let's actually have more conversations even with the people who think that they know how to run the world, because increasingly most of them are realizing they really don't. John, thank you for that. Um, so, so, so important, so true. Uh, David, uh, would you also please uh, respond to the same question? And I know then thereafter you will segue into what will be a, a quick guided appreciative inquiry process mm. for our audience. <laughs> Thank you, Audrey. Um, yes, and I, I just, um, I just want to say I love the conversation. And um, Jillian talked about the stories that we're not hearing. Um, we have a data bank at Case Western Reserve University with six thousand stories. It's called the data bank is called Aim to Flourish. And I have to say that the, there are just so many stories from all over the world that aren't reaching, uh, reaching all of us. And um, and I, you know, with that said, um, my big hope is about us together. Um, Meg Wheatley said something like, there is no collective power greater than a community discovering what it cares about. And um, we've been invited to end this panel by sharing some questions and then with the um, technology of Hopin, be able to go into some paired conversations. And so I've been um, posing and thinking about some of these questions. And if you have, let me pose the three questions for you. And if you could just jot down um, a, a little note to yourself, if you could just jot down some notes and then um, reflect a little bit individually, and then you'll find yourself and there'll be instructions. You'll find yourself um, with someone that you've met, probably never met, um, someone that you can do a joint exploration with here. Um, and I love Mary Oliver's um, in terms of the discovery mindset. She said, instructions for living a life, pay attention, be astonished, tell about it. And when it's over, I want to say all my life was a bride married to amazement. I was the bride, bridge groom, bridegroom taking the world into my arms. So the three questions and just jot down a couple notes to yourself. The first one, um, 
is um, is that we're all, you know, leaders, obviously. Meg Wheatley defined leadership, and I love it, the way she did it. Meg Wheatley defined leadership as um, a leader is anyone and everyone who wants to make a difference at this time. And um, as leaders, you know, we've all had ups and downs and high points and low points and helping to move towards the and unleash the power of markets and build a better world. We've all had experiences. Um, and obviously there have been ups and downs and high points and low points. What I'd like you to think about with question one is the high point moment in your career, a time that stands out in a leadership moment that where you were most alive, most passionate, most engaged, and able to come together with others to make some significant change happen. And again, you might have several high point moments in your career, or in your life, um, but I'd like you to, it helps with this exercise to single out the one, one high point moment where you felt most alive as a change leader um, to help build this kind of better world, a community, a family, a company, um, a marketplace, and so on. So just jot down, you know, when was that high point moment for you? And what are some insights for us as leaders in moving our SOCAP mission forward? The second one, um, I'd like to, in the spirit of Jillian's notion of lifting up the stories, um, I want to put a spotlight on innovation and um, insights um, into the business of better world, business of building a better world. And the SOCAP community believes that market innovations are a critical part of advancing this solution revolution. Um, and we love to learn while leaning forward. And it's true that somewhere in the world, it's already tomorrow. So if you could put the spotlight on just one innovation or emerging possibility, a story of uniting the power of markets with social entrepreneurships, equity and inclusion, climate action, bold leadership. If you could put the spotlight on just one story of innovation that lights up your sense of hope or the possible, what's that one story you'd like to share with your partner? Again, just to jot down a couple notes to yourself. And then the third question, um, I'd like us to cast, you know, invite us to put our, cast our minds forward. Um, we have a couple critical decades ahead of us. The next couple decades are decisive. Um, and I'd like to just um, invite you to articulate your, your, your visions of a better world. So let's assume tonight that we have a pretty good sleep and and it is a good sleep, um, and you don't wake up until 2040, almost two decades from now. Um, and But while you were asleep, there were so many small impacts that combined. There were some major breakthroughs that began to happen. And it's almost like a miracle, and the world became what you would most like to sleep, to see. And so you wake up. And the time has passed and this, and you're invited to get a panoramic view of our relationships as a human family, of our markets, of our, you know, ecology and nature and relationship to each other. You get to see a panoramic view of everything and you love what you see, you know, um, you, you're inspired by what you see. And what I'd like you to do now is, is you wake up and, Describe it to us. You know, what's happening in your vision of this future? What's happening that's different than today? What's happening that's new? And what's happening that's changed? Again, and how do you know it? What are the signals and signs? So look forward to the, um, having some small group discussions and carrying on this exploration. Um, and at the end of your discussion, just feed back to your partner some things you heard that you resonate with and, and then just thank them for a great conversation and we'll come back to the whole conference. Thank you so much, David for the guided process, which I hope all the audience and attendees will find fruitful as they connect with uh, someone new uh, to undertake the exercise. Uh, I'd like to say thank you 
to all of our panelists. What an incredible, inspired group. And uh, I invite you uh, each to, to, to sign off with, with a few parting words uh, for our audience. John, uh, maybe you can start. <laughs> well, it's been great fun to be part of this. I look forward to the continuing conversation, as I say, to the book. And for me, uh, uh, something that would be an indicator that we got elements of this right would be wildlife coming back, not because of COVID or whatever, but because we put space out there for, for uh, nature. Thank you. Gillian. Thanks again for the invitation to share in this conversation. I think for me, what I would want to close in saying is that if we do wake up in 2040, I hope that there will have been more light and fewer blind spots that allow flourishing from many different parts of the world. Thanks, Jillian. Raj. You know, I'm reminded of the quote by William Gibson, who said, the future is already here. It's just unevenly divided mm -hmm. uh, or distributed. And I think the fact is the solutions are out there. You know, at Paul Hawkins' recent work showing how we actually, there are 100 proven solutions to address all of the challenges that we face from a, a environment and climate uh, standpoint. And, and our systems are resilient. They are able to come back to life. So, so I think sometimes people get despondent and lose a sense of hope and possibility. But I think there's, there's really nothing that we cannot do, as, as, uh, as, as David said earlier, uh, once we are all inspired and motivated and connected to each other. So we are just all to stay positive and to become a part of this, this movement. Thank you, David. David. And I just want to thank SOCAP for um, the, the movement um, and the growth of the movement. I think this is an incredible opportunity time for the whole SOCAP community. Um, and I just want to end with, you know, it's not about empty hope, but um, David Orr, the ecologist, talks and he said, defines hope. Hope is a verb with our sleeves rolled up. Thank you, David. A slight connectivity issue. Thank you, David, for that inspiring uh, finale. I would just like to thank as well from my side, the SOCAP organizers, the team. This community has grown with thousands upon thousands of people. We're uh, honored to be among you and to share uh, some of the, the work of the business of building a better world. And if it's anywhere that it's going to happen that these that these thoughts and 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 the wisdom shared uh, fi find a place to, to to seed and nest and grow, it's going to be in SOCAP in this community. So um, thank you all, and wishing you a good rest of the conference. Mm -hmm.